Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I could see more than 40 people joining us today, and a lot of people will uh, watch the recording afterwards. Welcome back. I would, uh, it is the middle of the night in Australia, so I, I'm guessing people will be watching through the video. Late, very late in Japan. It's a, it's a late afternoon in Netherlands. Welcome, everybody, on the side of the ocean. <clears throat> My name is Oleg Stukolov. I work for University of Waterloo, Waterloo Institute for Nanotechnology. Technology. My role here is business development manager. I deal with companies, help to get new projects off the ground. I also support our startups together with other units uh, on, on, on the campus. Uh, so today I will be your session lead, uh, and I will introduce briefly our speakers. Uh, so our first speaker in today's session is Ronnie Van Over, uh, co-founder and CEO of Micronic Microtechnology, a company in Netherlands. He also a board member of Nanonex, uh, and now an organization developing a nanotechnology strategy for Netherlands. Uh, Ronnie, I will, I will let you start your presentation. Okay, thank you. Thanks uh, for this opportunity to tell something about uh, the ecosystem in the Netherlands. Uh, let me first start introducing myself to understand the context. Um, I'm Ronnie van Toever, CEO of uh, Micronet Microtechnologies, a company that is around for around 20 years and has uh, come to its uh, size through the ecosystem in the Netherlands. Uh, we're located in uh, Enschede, the Netherlands, uh, very close to one of the biggest institutes in, in the world in nanotechnology, the Mesa Plus Institute, and the Technical University, which is known for its uh, decades of excellent nanotechnology research. Um, so I think uh, the, the, I started the company 20 years ago, a bit more. So we're supposed to have a big celebration this year, but as anybody knows, it's also COVID season in the Netherlands. So uh, we had to postpone the barbecue and the festivities this year, but uh, what keeps us going is still the, the, the vision of Micronet that with nanotechnology we want to uh, create products that, that uh, people can age healthy. And um, we do that already uh, about 20 years. We're ISO certified, a lot of applications in the medical field with a team of over 100 people. So we're one of the biggest SMEs in um, in this field in the Netherlands, and we really focused on lab on a chip and um, medical technologies for next generation sequencing, uh, liquid biopsy, single cell analysis, a lot of point of care and cell culturing. So really typical applications where nanotechnology is combined with uh, life sciences applications in health and medical fields. Um, so I think that's that's kind of typical the area that we've I personally build up a lot of experience through the years. And with that, um, yeah, we make great products that integrate all kinds of nanotechnologies where uh, the, the, the nanotechnologies that are used to create the microfluidics uh, are combined with electronics, are combined with CMOS technology for biosensing and nanotechnology surface activation, pumps, and on top of that, the, the cells and also the, the wet nanotechnology, so we call it the reagents, are all necessary to make something that, that really solves uh, a problem. So this is an example of one of the things and of many, many other things we do. Um, so this is kind of the brief introduction to, to Micronet. It's one of the companies in the ecosystem, so we'll not elaborate too much on that, but if anybody seeks a, a contract developer and a, and a manufacturer of lab on a chip based products, uh, please contact us. We're all, all, always welcome to support uh, commercial initiatives. Um, but then I'll basically go to the core of this presentation. Uh, it's basically about the ecosystem in the Netherlands. Um, I've been part of that for about 20 years uh, already. Uh, starting as a student and now being a board member of NanonexNL, and I'm uh, it, it's uh, there's a little correction on the on the presentation announcement. I'm a former chairman of Minutnet. I, I was that until just before the summer when we uh, when I decided to contribute to this uh, great uh, conference. Um, and I'm also responsible as chairman of the nanotechnology. Uh, Roadmap. So that's basically what what can we do together uh, with uh, support of the government towards the future as institutes and companies to 
really help society with uh, with technology, and that all comes together in Nano for Society, which is kind of a plan we made with companies, institutes uh, that we presented last year to the Dutch government uh, to to get us going. Um, and the ecosystem in the Netherlands is is, is roughly divided in uh, Minaknet, which kind of represents the companies in the ecosystem. Um, that uh, that's more a trade organization, so you can, can be a member of that uh, in the Netherlands. And there's Nano XNL, which is uh, more framework for uh, public-private partnerships, and that's basically corporations between companies and institutes that uh, together do uh, research and product development on relevant teams that uh, are uh, at the lower tier levels up to the high tier levels, so from real ideation to uh, high tier levels close to market. And those programs are supported by the uh, Dutch government. And there's, of course, Nano Lapanel, uh, another party. And that's kind of, there's some overlap between the activities of the three parties. But uh, the biggest distinction is that Nano Lapanel really represents the infrastructure we need for all that great work. Because I think, uh, as m many people are aware, that for nanotechnology, you need quite uh, expensive equipment and infrastructure. So it's quite efficient to share that very delicate equipment and infrastructure. And that's kind of what's, yeah, what, what, what's, has, is what the Netherlands does within Nano Lapanel. So around the big technology universities and institutes, there, there's a lot of infrastructure that's also accessible for uh, startups, scale-ups, and big companies to do their research uh, together with the institutes and also the, their early stage product development and small scale uh, manufacturing uh, for uh, proof of concept and yeah, the, the first phase of a business case uh, before real scale is uh, in, in, in the business. Um, the Nano uh, for Society program um, is, was triggered by the vision of the Dutch government that we should focus together on solutions and those solutions are around uh, the, the, the bigger teams in society, like energy, like health, food, and uh, the, the security. And together with the whole ecosystem, there was a, a plan presented. And um, I think it's great to see such, uh, yeah, I've, I've been involved in the program and getting to this uh, plan. And it's really great to see how many uh, yeah, solutions really depend on nanotechnology. And I think that's what what struck me. There's a lot of nanotechnology in a lot of products, although it's not on the surface, it it, it, it is in there. And I think that as a nanotechnology community, we want to make people aware of that. And it's also very clear that for a lot of those solutions, there are international corporations because, yeah, Sometimes one piece of the puzzle is, puzzle is developed on the other side of the world, and I think we need to find each other to make a, a total solution for society. So that's also nice to be part of such an ecosystem as we are present today. Um, and I think that's where we need to find each other. So I'm sorry, uh, I have to. So a little bit more about Minaknet. It's really a trade organization, and uh, its focus is together with all the members, uh, we want to create economic activity. So really not only do the research, but make products out of it that companies can bring to the market. And all the activities of MinecNet are centered around uh, that objective. Um, so that's where researchers, entrepreneurs, but also the gov government work together to create uh, great uh, products. And uh, one of the meetings that we normally have face-to-face -face, uh, at least once a year, is the big international micro nano conference that's held in December most of the time. Uh, this year it will be online. I will tell a little bit more about that. Oh, I'm sorry about that. So, the international conference. Um, the ecosystem, this is typical uh, example of members, so some logos of the members of Minagnet. Um, in the Netherlands, the ecosystem is quite rich, um, and that's yeah, basically because there has been a vision for around yeah, almost 20 years that um, the government and institutes together have worked together to create a lot of SMEs in the field, so startups and 
SME. So around the Technical University of Twente, for example, there's a lot of spin-offs uh, that use nanotechnology for their products. And I think that's also the a little bit the case in uh, other, other technical universities, but uh, yeah, due to the history of, of and also the focus of the Technical University of Twente, the, there's a little bit more around the Mesa Plus Institute of SME entrepreneurship. And I think that's also the reason that Micronet uh, was founded around 20 years ago around the University of Twente. Uh, so this is just a few logos. So please go to the website of MeaningNet to get some details there. I, I want to highlight a couple of things because in the beginning of the crisis uh, in, in the Netherlands, that's around March when we got a full lockdown, uh, a lot of uh, activity was triggered around COVID and what can nanotechnology uh, and the research already going on uh, do to, to get us out of this crisis faster. And so this is one example. This is a company, uh, Spin-Off FICAP. They uh, filter cells out of blood with uh, uh, sieves that are made with nanotechnology. And they are uh, able to then pick one cell out of that array for further research with DNA analysis. So that, I think the, the, the value they bring is they can really accelerate the research uh, towards finding the right antibodies for, for instance, corona. So there's a great uh, sample. Example is where uh, SMEs can react swiftly and, and quickly towards a changing environment. So they, this product is quite successful. There's um, a fierce particle that has technology to make uh, uh, sensor layers, one of the members of MinicNet, and that's also nanotechnology-based uh, layers. And there was... Um, yeah, they spun out a company, Fierce Particle, that, that is now working on an ultra-fast test for virus uh, analysis. So it's another example of where nanotechnology and entrepreneurship uh, really come together and one of the great examples of nanotechnology in the Netherlands. Then we have Uneedle, another company that, that makes really specialized, accurate uh, needles for uh, liquid uh, intradermal injection, and they use uh, nanotechnology-based uh, needles for that. So that's a company that has been around, and uh, they now believe they have found a niche where they can actually get more doses out of one vaccination, so basically increase the, the amount of value they create, uh, or actually increase the amount of people you can actually get out of one milliliter of uh, 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 Vaccine, and so so that they also get a lot of uh, attention. Um, one other project I would like to mention is a project we are in, involved ourselves um, as Micronet, together with another five SMEs in the region of uh, eastern side of the Netherlands, and we are also working on a rapid test for uh, home testing of uh, COVID because a lot of tests are performed uh, at a side testing site in the Netherlands. So we have the vision that we want to be more virus ready towards the future and bring testing maybe to the home or closer to the people at least. That's another project. Um, another announcement really recent was uh, breaking news kind of for our region that Metspray, a company that has been around for a couple of years, is now really scaling up its uh, manufacturing and also has created a joint venture where they create a nanotechnology-based uh, inhaler. Uh, technology for the, in, it, they, they place that in a joint venture and are scaling up also towards drug delivery and vaccine delivery for uh, for for instance uh, respiratory uh, problems, which is also quite a relevant team at the moment. Um, so that's kind of a brief overview of what's there. I, I think there's way too much in the Netherlands on nanotechnology to tell you about today. Uh, there's limited time. Um, if you want to create a better overview of what's uh, present in the Netherlands in more detail, there's a, a conference online. It, it should have been in Utrecht, but uh, it, it went completely online this year. So it will be accessible for everybody 3rd and 4th of December. So please register, register if you haven't done already uh, to learn more about all those great companies and, and initiatives in that uh, conference. So with that... Um, I would like to conclude. Uh, I think uh, I brought you back on schedule, maybe. Um, so then, uh, if you want to know more about MinecNet or NanoNXNL, please uh, contact uh, Aurelie Veltema. Um, if you seek partners in the Netherlands for 
productization or what how they call it to make a product out of uh, your nanotechnology uh, that's also a, a good point to start so with that I would like to conclude and give the word back to our uh, session chair thank you Ronnie for an interesting presentation I, I, I'm sure you have way more you can share if, if we have if you only had more time uh, Dr. Alex Tukalov who is WIN Business Development Manager who will give the next presentation. Oleg, please. So, uh, I already was introduced. I wouldn't spend too much time. The one, the one thing I wanted to share in this presentation, I will give you a brief overview of uh, regional Waterloo, Toronto, Waterloo uh, corridor, uh, or your ecosystem uh, in the town and uh, around the university itself. And we'll touch briefly on the process of startup creation at the University of Waterloo. I will start briefly to give you some, some idea of so-called Toronto Butler Region Corridor. You might not heard that term before. Uh, a few years ago, the city of Toronto and city of, and then region of Butler got together and decided to co-promote each other, uh, to, to, to basically talk, promote two regions together when they faced the, the world outside. Uh, it was very effective so far. Uh, you all know geography very well. I wouldn't spend much time there. I wanted to to point to one uh, fact uh, specifically. When when you hear us saying Waterloo, what we usually mean it's regional Waterloo, Waterloo region. This region includes three cities: Waterloo, Kitchener, and Cambridge. On this Google map, you could see three of us collocated. If you visit us one day, you will see there is no formal border between the cities. It's all one community these days, but we still have three municipalities, three mayors, and, and but uh, four levels of government. Each municipal government and also regional government that share their responsibilities. The region itself uh, is rapidly growing in terms of uh, technology innovation. Uh, last year, we become first in North America in terms of density of technology talent per capita living in this region, <coughs> and uh, we've got a very good influx of, of of people from the states moving to Canada, moving their companies as well. So that's how we get a boost in the talent locally. And also, we are the second in the world concentra highest concentration of startups per capita, trailing behind uh, the Silicon Valley alone. Uh, there is a lot of companies, like you can see some statistics here. I wouldn't spend too much time. Some of the I will only point a couple of. A uh, couple of companies here desire to learn uh, and the open tax both uh, University of Waterloo. Spin off companies desire to learn is educational software. Almost all the universities in Canada, many in the States are using this software to run their entire educational system. Open tax, the largest software company in Canada, 12,000 employees around the world. But that was uh, the open tax, but that's a spin off company from research done at University of Waterloo more than 20 years ago. Another interesting fact, in 2019, the top three fastest growing companies were all located here in Waterloo region. And Apply Board, it's an amazing company. Yeah, go Google them to see. They become a unicorn company in three years. It is quite amazing statistics. <clears throat> okay, uh, I will quickly switch to the region, uh, our region's entrepreneurship ecosystem. Our ecosystem kind of build around uh, a business incubation organization called Communitac. It serves more than uh, 1,400 technology startup companies right in our region alone. Started in 1997, uh, located initially at the University of Atlo campus, but then they managed to get enough funding and moved into this new beautiful building. It is 100 years old building that used to be a laser manufacturing. At some point, it was the largest laser manufacturing in British Empire. Uh, so that building was heavily renovated to be to to to, to make office space. You you already seen D2L. I told about that. Uh, so the, the detail is located in this building. You see the Google logo here as well. Google used to start their Waterloo office here at the top floor, but they now constructed their own building and constructing the second building. They have 1,000 employees in the region and adding 2,000 more in the next two years. Um, it is the Canada's most regarded business incubator. A lot of municipalities are coming here to learn the best practices. Another, maybe less uh, known 
uh, business accelerator called the Accelerator Center. It is located at the University of Waterloo campus. It actually started as a University of Waterloo uh, organization uh, in 2016. It, it started around uh, a, very, a very relatively unique high-density milestone-driven business scale-up program. The companies who accepted there usually already have some traction with the customers are starting to get the traction and they quickly propelling through their business development. And many companies who start uh, that selection, they, they would move to become members of Comunitech or they will just run the space uh, inside of the town and continue growing. Uh, the next area of, of, of presentation is around what, like some facts about Mr. Watlow that you might not see, you might not know, and also a little bit of a nanotechnology engineering program. There is a few facts on this slide. Uh, we, we, we have a lot of number ones for University of Waterloo in general. I wouldn't go too much detail. The one fact I wanted to point is that 30% of all research funding at University of Waterloo coming through industry partnerships. And this will be the money that companies contributed towards the project directly. And plus, the funding we received through the funding agencies like NSERC and MITAS that was mentioned yesterday already. <clears throat> Uh, the, another fact I wanted to bring your attention to is this in this one. It is, the University of Waterloo is the university is number one in, university in Canada for venture capital backed entrepreneurs. Uh, so entrepreneurship is part of the university ecosystem from the day one, from the university founding. And you will see some of the facts why is that the case. Okay, nanotechnology engineering undergraduate program. This is the only program in Canada it was founded in 2000, uh, 2005. It, it, it currently admits about 120 students annually, so we have more than 500 students in this program every single year. And it takes five years to finish the program, uh, but part of that education is of full two years of work experience. We call it co-op placement, co-op experience. So the, the, comp uh, the students will have a job for four up, like between four to eight months at a time, so they mix together. Uh, in class education and, and practical experience in the companies. And that's what makes this program unique and many other engineering programs on the campus. And many students go on to do grad studies. Uh, a lot of them go to the top schools in the US. Some stay here at University of Waterloo and then I keep finding uh, graduates doing grad studies everywhere in the world as well. But also this program is well known for startup creation. It is uh, for all the science-based non-software related startup companies, nanotechnology engineers are beating uh, everyone on the campus. <clears throat> okay, um, so now I'm switching to, to give you an overview of University of Waterloo Entrepreneurship Ecosystem and how it operates. <clears throat> Why we are number one in Canada? Uh, well, uh, the, uh, because we have entrepreneurship DNA, as they call it, uh, built into the university. As a result, University of Waterloo made a significant economic impact and Canadian economy. So these numbers there uh, were extracted from their Deloitte Canada Economic Impact Report published 2019. Some of the numbers, for example, uh, this number is uh, for 10 years, covering 2008-2019. Period of time, uh, 170 million Canadian dollars were contributed to the economy in one year alone. Okay, <clears throat> the one unique thing that many of you already heard about is our unique creator-owned intellectual property policy. What that exactly means, if you are a researcher, a researcher we mean a professor, that student and then postdoc, and if, you're, uh, if you created some new innovation, new technology in your research lab, you have full freedom, automatically full freedom, to exploit this IP on your own. A university does not take ownership automatically. The only, uh, the only condition uh, is to list existing contract, for example, this private company or this funding agency, but that, that IP not longer in, in, in place, but, but majority cases it is. Uh, once a new innovation, new technology being developed, uh, researchers have two options. They can go straight and commercialize on their own, or they can work with our own technology transfer office called VATCO. But even when VATCO takes on a project, it, they, don't, they don't take ownership of the invention. They only sign a contract with inventors to represent them in commercial setting. And that's the arrangement that worked very well for the, for, for the university over the years. <clears throat> okay, with multiple 
units on university campus that support startup company creation uh, and scale up. So the most prominent and most famous uh, business incubator is called Velocity. We call it Velocity Program. I have another slide to give you a little bit more overview of Velocity, how it evolved. Velocity now has two, 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 two units on its own, it's split apart in two, two parts. One we now call Velocity Garage. And then second one is now called uh, Concept. The Concept, it's a Velocity activities on campus education for students and everyone else who is willing to, to, to learn about entrepreneurship. Uh, it's, an, it's a mentorship for students starting up. And Velocity Garage, uh, Program. It's now a like it's, it's a place for companies to to stay and also grow. We also have another uh, another unit on the campus. We don't call it department. It, it is called uh, it's called Science Innovation Hub. I will I will let you know when it become. It used to be part of the lot, but now it has its own independent life. 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 Uh, another prominent that I already mentioned, Watlo Technology Transfer Office, is to Watlo also involved in startup creations. And we also have a relatively small program called Masters of Business Internship in Technology. It is modeled after an MBA, but the difference is it is business education related to technology, innovation, and startup creation specifically. And most of the students are actually technical students have engineering science degrees who, uh, who come to the program. The program, if I remember correctly, admits about 30 to 40 students every year. And the question is, the Rattling Institute for Not Technology, we, we're running our own small young startup catalyst program uh, to, to support the students uh, and the researchers who, who are starting up. Uh, this kind of a very busy slide tells about the history of Velocity program on the campus. It started in 2008 as actually Velocity residence. So the university set aside a one building for the residents and they accepted students with business ideas into that residence. They spent one semester living there, they had some education happening every day, mentorship happening at night after the classes. The program was so successful, a lot of very promising and um, profitable companies in our region actually started at the time, and I only have a couple of examples there. Uh, the lost two residents grew very quickly in two years, it had to expand, it moved out of University of Atlo campus, co-located with community tech and that old tunnel, uh, the tunnel building that I showed you in the previous slide, <clears throat> it expanded again when Google moved out from the building and vacated a lot of space. And the lost expanded once again, quite substantially. Uh, in 2016, uh, the lost is part of uh, so-called the lost design. It was an older chemistry lab, uh, undergraduate chemistry lab that was set aside for startup creation. Uh, the lost design uh, just uh, early this year was renamed Science Innovation Hub. It started to live on its own life. There was another change that happened last year, a very interesting change, is that the Velocity changed their model. It used to be free for University of Atlas students and recent alumni, but now they're accepting uh, all kinds of companies across Canada and abroad, and, and the programming is, is a little bit more sophisticated now. Uh, so that's their model for growth in the future. This slide already outdated just really, like just three weeks ago, there was an announcement, announcement made that University of Atlo is developing a new so-called health campus in downtown Kitchener, outside of University of Atlo main campus. And the lost will be moving to the new building in three or four years from now. Again, expanding again. Yeah. Keep growing. They don't have enough space left. <clears throat> okay. So I wanted to briefly talk to you about a, a, a different streams of startup creation on the university campus. Okay. Uh, two of the streams that you see now, it's relatively known to you. Uh, it's, it's kind of the model that's being in place for for uh, in, in other universities. One of the streams is like it's the one I mentioned. It's uh, when you undergraduate students engaged in in the in the startup creation, and they go to business incubation, get to the investors, and they reach the marketplace afterwards. Another typical process is one research spans off into into a startup company, and most universities that go through the technology transfer offices. But on the University of Atlo campus, uh, you know, uh, researchers have uh, already mentioned that another another option they can skip this and they go they can go directly to investors. And if you would look at the statistics, it looks like this is equally successful processes in the campus. 
Uh, there is another another process that started to develop very recently, and then we hope that eventually we'll expand it into a new programming. And this is relatively unique. Uh, some in undergraduate graduates at the University of Waterloo are not so interested in doing grad studies per se, but they're interested to start a science-based company. Well, that's difficult. It takes time to, to develop. So now what we see happening uh, naturally, some with graduates come to a professor, ask the professor, I would like to become a grad student in your lab, but I want to start my own company. Would you accept me? <laughs> Can we have an agreement? Uh, and, and that already happened. We have one prominent company called Nikoi Life Sciences that was created this way. Uh, a a, a non-technology engineering grad student, uh, undergrad student, become a master student, develop the technology as part of his master thesis. There's the company. This year, his, uh, his company expanded to 50 people who received the government approval for developing antibody testing machines. So we, there is a work done on campus to one day formalize this process. Uh, the, the process of doing them, perhaps creating master's entrepreneurship or a master's degree. And I would like to thank you for your attention. That's all I had, uh, giving the time. Thank you, Oleg, for your excellent presentation. So I will um, introduce our next speaker, Adrian Seeps. She is a research coordinator for Nanotechnology at National Institute for Public Health and Environment. Adrian expertise around bridging science to public to the policy development at nation and international level. Adrian, uh, please. Thank you. Well, um, in the first place, I, I want to thank the organizers um, for giving me the opportunity to present perhaps a somewhat different perspective than most of the presentations are, and that's a perspective on uh, safe and sustainable development of nanotechnology, perhaps rather than, uh, as, as the title of this workshop is, on um, how can nanotechnology contribute to a sustainable future uh, itself? Um, I want to, to give you some shed on uh, how uh, this connects to science and innovation. And I think um, especially nanotechnology is, is such a good example where already uh, quite some innovative approaches have been developed um, uh, to, to demonstrate how we can, uh, let's say, uh, uh, reach for the ambitions uh, as laid down in the sustainability goals. Uh, can I have the first, the next slide, please? Um, well, of course, the, the, the drivers for doing um, research and innovation are, uh, I think, especially laid down by the by the SDGs. Uh, but also in Europe, we have uh, a new policy called the European Green Deal, and uh, that's much connected to the safe uh, to, the, to the sustainable development goals. Uh, but it's also, uh, I think, um, with, with uh, lots of ambitions. And, of course, we have extra ambitions uh, due by the COVID-19 uh, crisis, uh, and I will come back to that later. But in essence, what is uh, stated, at least in the European Green Deal, is uh, that research and innovation is pivotal to, to reach for these ambitions. And um, we are now preparing the new framework program, that's the Research and Innovation Program uh, of the European Union, uh, that will be starting in 2022. And in upfront, uh, in the um, uh, current uh, program, which is called H2020, uh, there is now uh, a quite large uh, call uh, for 1 billion euros, uh, on, um, which is called the European Green Deal call. And it's, it's much on uh, how can we recover from uh, this COVID crisis and what can uh, the science that's already out there, uh, and, and I think there's also a huge demand for, for nanotechnology, uh, how can it help us? Next slide, sir, please. Um, well, what I already mentioned, um, the Green Deal is uh, full of ambition, uh, and, and we need that ambition uh, at the sustainability goals also uh, demand and urgency. Um, well, goals have to be achieved in 2030 or 2050, but that is a very short notice for all that needs to be done. Um, here I put some keywords on this slide, and um, you can imagine behind each keyword is, is a whole world of science and innovation uh, in itself behind it. Um, what, what makes it perhaps also different uh, in Horizon Europe program compared to former framework programs it's, it's not about, let's say, academic science anymore, but we really need to achieve goals. Uh, so things have to be put in practice, and that all within this short uh, span of time. Um, 
and and all these uh, different um, keywords, they they also are more or less connected, and sometimes uh, very much connected, and sometimes you know a bit um, more indirect. But uh, they all have to to do with each other. Next slide, please. So uh, over the last year, uh, and, and of course it was started earlier on, uh, various strategies uh, have been developed and uh, also uh, now made public uh, by the European Union. And um, well, what you can see here is there are, let's say, um, um, strategies on um, chemicals, on, on how to uh, develop sustainable chemicals, um, also uh, ready for a circular economy. Uh, the same is for pharmaceuticals. Uh, how to deal with plastics? Well, you can go on and on for that. Circular economy, of course, is also a very important one. Um, and these are not all strategies in itself. All, also, these strategies are um, interconnected, although it's not specifically addressed how it's interconnected and what it means for your own field. But especially a key technology like nanotechnology has to deal with all these different strategies. So that makes it, um, to say the least, uh, a challenge. But I think, um, well, if, if there's one area uh, in, in science which is capable of doing so, I think it's nanotechnology, because we're used to, to work in interdisciplinary ways, and because we are used that we're, let's say, part of uh, other technologies, or that's uh, what is called nanotechnology inside, as already mentioned by, uh, by Ronnie. I have the next slide, sir, please. Um, regarding safe and sustainable, uh, I'm not sure whether you're familiar what's going on there, but uh, my institute, uh, the National Institute for Public Health and the Environment in the, in the Netherlands, uh, abbreviated like RIVM, um, is, is doing research already uh, for 15 years. And um, in, in uh, Europe, we have uh, a strong community uh, come together in the so-called nano safety cluster. Uh, I really would encourage you to, to visit uh, their website to see what's going on, because this nano safety cluster has also connections to the various regions uh, in the world, to, to the US and Canada, to, to Asia and uh, Australia. Um, and uh, wherever possible, we tried to, to tune and align uh, our activities and uh, to start collaborations um, in uh, projects in the Horizon 2020 uh, program. Uh, we have these uh, consortia, which includes also um, countries from uh, outside uh, the EU. Uh, so we have quite a long-standing uh, collaboration uh, together, all to, to tune. Uh, let's say, the goals we are heading for and, and to share the knowledge. In this uh, project, we have started uh, already for, I think, well, around 10 years ago, um, to start develop, to, to start um, develop concepts like safe by design. And those of you working in nanomedicine are quite familiar with it, but it's not a concept which is uh, commonly used, for example, in, in nanomaterials development or uh, in, in uh, various consumer products developments. And uh, we have looked whether it's feasible and whether it brings something extra uh, which could benefit uh, the innovators and regulators uh, at the same time. Um, well, coming from that uh, safe by design concept, we uh, further developed that uh, to uh, a safe innovation approach, which includes also uh, preparedness by regulators to, to look what's coming ahead, for example, if you come up with a, a self-driving car, uh, you know it's still a car and you can consider that in regulations as, okay, we're done because we have regulations for cars, but everybody uh, already feels at first moment that, that there is something extra to it and that you have to be aware for that. Um, but developing new regulations or um, regulations for new products uh, also requires um, developing new science and, uh, and innovation. So. Um, that is why we think that it's so uh, important to, to work upfront uh, on these concepts. Um, and a new concept, uh, which combines even more safe and sustainable biodesign, um, is really pivotal in the European chemical strategy, uh, and that is also, I think, in other areas in the world uh, adopted as, as a strategy 
um, which is very much in line with, with the SDGs and which we uh, should focus on. It's easier said than done, so uh, it, it's not uh, just pulling together safe by design and adding a, a source of uh, sustainability to it and then we're there. Uh, it really is uh, some hard work ahead, but um, I think the good news is that we have started a project or will start a project in January 21, um, where, uh, which is called, uh, I think, with a very nice name, Sunshine, focusing on safe by design of uh, complex uh, nanomaterials and looking whether we can fit that in a uh, safe and sustainable by design uh, concept. So there you see again a nice example of um, being a bit on the, on the forefront uh, and, and uh, well, uh, making, uh, let's say, uh, an, an, uh, a view on how can we uh, address these uh, keywords as there are in, in the um, policies and uh, also in the various strategies. Next slide, please. Um, Horizon Europe is, so what I already mentioned, uh, well, perhaps in, in some areas the same, but also uh, distinct from uh, former framework programs, and especially uh, the words uh, mentioned in, in red are real characteristics, uh, and I think also real challenges uh, for how to perform uh, our research. And it's, it's not just uh, phrases, it's, it's really uh, something I think characteristics um, we, we want to, to um, give um, well some meaning to. Um, preparedness and resilience is something, as long as the COVID crisis is there, will, will be in the front of our minds. But also um, urgency is something uh, we need to be aware of. So we also need to change some systems to make more progress in a shorter uh, time. Next slide, uh, please. Um, well, as you can see here, um, and, and that is a little bit uh, how we uh, envisage uh, the, the interactions between the various um, stakeholders and the various areas we need to work with, uh, you might have heard of the triple helix uh, for collaborations, uh, but we think the quadruple helix is, uh, is, is a more uh, meaningful word in, in that. Um, as you see, science and innovation is, is put at the heart uh, of, of the many policies and is seen pivotal to, to, to uh, address these uh, goals. Um, on one hand, um, it, it is, let's say, uh, science that uh, needs to lead to, to entrepreneurship and to, to, to more commercial activities. In the end, it should uh, lead to improved national earning capacities and to valorization, of course, of knowledge. On the other hand, there are societal uh, demands uh, and societal values and needs that needs to be addressed, like uh, laid down in, in the SDGs and in uh, the Green Deal. Um, but uh, from a, a regulatory perspective, um, well, we, we keep, let's say, now running behind what's going on in, in the top of this slide, um, and, and we're always late. Uh, that is something we need to improve. We, we need to find other ways to keep pace with uh, what's going on in these uh, two areas. Um, what I uh, would try to stress with uh, the circles uh, uh, on, on the different parts of the helix is that we, let's say, all live a little bit in our own bubbles because it's already complex enough there to, to have uh, enough connection to um, all the stakeholders that are uh, involved within that bubble or with all the different uh, disciplines or the different sectors we need uh, to deal with. Next slide, please. Um, and coming from that perspective, um, we thought uh, that What's something that is needed to come to more efficient um, uh, science and innovation and to come to a more efficient process that delivers on the goals, um, we, we think we need, uh, let's say, a kind of communication tool that we understand each other, what's going on in each other's areas. And um, in, in this slide, um, in the various uh, parts of the helix, um, I, I mentioned some of the examples of European um, initiatives that are going on 
where people already tried within their bubble to to uh, well to, to to connect to each other and to come up with with alignment of activities. Uh, but what's really still missing is the connection between these um, various aspects. Um, and, and we see that, uh, as mentioned before, the characteristics as drawn in the Horizon Europe and the, the demands of the uh, SDGs and the Green Deal ask for urgency and, and more efficiency. Can I have the next slide, please? So um, what um, inspired us was the technology readiness levels that are there. Uh, I think, uh, especially in the Horizon programs, we see in every poll, uh, this is the status now. Let's say uh, this is how we regard that in a certain poll, um, well, a certain topic is, let's say, in uh, level one. And uh, the Commission expects that after four years, you will be in level, well, give it a name, six or so. Um, and uh, that is quite clear to, to everybody dealing uh, with these um, uh, programs and with these calls. It's, it's clear to the ones who uh, establish and uh, formulate uh, the calls, but it's also clear for those who uh, have to give shape to projects uh, in these calls. So for that reason, um, well, something like this might be uh, also very relevant for the other areas. May I have the next slide, please? Yeah, and that is why we thought um, perhaps it would be a good idea to develop something similar also for um, the other areas, for, so for what we call society readiness uh, and regulatory readiness. And, and this is perhaps not uh, rocket science. It, it's not that bright and new because uh, you can't find in literature people who have given it some thoughts, but let's say, only on the axis on technology and society, or only on the axis of regulatory and society. Um, and um, perhaps it's not that difficult to uh, come up with ideas on how to define the levels uh, one to nine, also for society and regulations. But um, I think the proof of the pudding is in uh, we have to need uh, to, to define a clear goal. So for society, is that um, accepted technology, is it um, accepted products uh, for regulations, is that um, are we there if we have uh, relevant international guidances and guidelines or other soft regulations or agreements or, well, what, what could be, let's say, um, the best uh, to strive for? Um, that is something uh, which also needs uh, some time. Um, and next slide, please. Uh, we think that uh, what is needed now is that uh, we need to define, in the first instance, the goals uh, we want to strive for, and then uh, give some shape to uh, what the different levels uh, could mean. But that's the easier part, as I said. Um, then the step is to seek support for the system and the levels. And you can't do that uh, just in an academic uh, uh, environment. You can't do that uh, on a national level. You have to do that on a much broader scale. And that is something that, uh, well, that's complex and uh, that also needs uh, some thinking. Um, but let's say if we could shape it in it, well, the first degree and test it in a, well, smaller context, uh, well, we thought preferably within the Nano for Society program, but I can imagine um, if you uh, think, well, we, we could add something to that or we are also eager to test some of these things, um, then, uh, well, please feel very welcome to contact us and, and to think with us because the more support we have for this approach, uh, the better it is. Um, and I think uh, what is also uh, something worthwhile to stress is, uh, as you perhaps uh, have seen, Every level starts with science, so also in the social arena, arena and also in the regulatory arena, it starts with science, with social sciences or with uh, toxicology or uh, with insights on, okay, what kind of uh, characteristics of materials uh, may lead to, to reactivity. That is something we also can translate in terms of the toxicology, but it's, it's uh, where it starts. And um, 
when we have these different uh, levels and have agreement on that and, and try to use them, um, then it's also very much worthwhile to test, okay, do we know from each other where in, let's say, our bubble we are on the technology side, on the society side, and on the regulation side? Uh, may I have my uh, last slide, please? Um, and here I um, have given just, a, a, well, let's say uh, an example. Uh, it can be any example. But for example, uh, what we see um, given from the uh, Green Deal or given from the, the SDGs, we see a demand for zero pollution, for less fossil fuels uh, use. And uh, well, one of the ideas to uh, address that uh, is, for example, um, electric vehicles. Um, so in, in society, there needs to come, and uh, there is already, I think, quite some acceptance, but there needs to be more acceptance of uh, driving electrical vehicles. Um, well, what we noticed is that there are now calls out also in this Green Deal for batteries uh, with uh, more capacity um, to, to have these uh, vehicles uh, driving over a longer distance without recharging. Um, for that, to that end, uh, advanced materials uh, are developed. But from a regulatory perspective, and this is, for example, now a discussion or, or at least a, an, an, um, uh, well, an inventorization, I would say, which is going on uh, in the OECD, is okay, but, but what do we consider from a regulatory perspective as advanced nanomaterials? And are the regulations, and especially the test guidelines, uh, clear enough, or uh, are they, um, well, also applicable to these nanomaterials? So producers know that when they use these guidelines uh, and, and guidances, that they really address uh, safety um, well, in, in a kind of a conclusive way, and, and that they uh, are helpful to them. Um, when you don't know from, let's say, each other's uh, discussions, it's difficult to deal with it. But by combining it, we think it will lead to more successful and more uh, you know, uh, efficient innovation uh, processes. So I want to end um, this uh, presentation with um, a key message, and uh, it, it is, of course, uh, well, perhaps a bit of a tricky one if I say get together, but even if it's uh, by means of online meetings. But I think uh, what I have tried to make clear is that the complexity that's ahead and uh, the time frame and the urgency we have that it is um, really demanding uh, more collaboration and co-creation. And I think uh, the nanotech community, um, well, on a worldwide scale, uh, has uh, so much potential to uh, at least create demonstrators uh, for doing so. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Adrian, for so much for your presentation. It's a, it's a little bit of a shift of course from the from technical topics to the social environmental impact, and I'm glad you finished on a battery topic because it's going to have impact not only on, on, on electrical cars and the cells, but sourcing the materials, dis discarding, discarding the the chemicals. Like it's it's huge. It's just enormous impact over the years. I would like to thank you all the presenters for being with us today. Uh, thank you so much.